All right, we'll go ahead and get started. I'm sure some more people will filter in as the presentation gets underway. So with that said, today we're gonna to be covering health savings accounts. If you do have any questions, make sure you do type those into the chat box as your audio has been muted on the attendee side. So my name is Alex Perney. Again, we're gonna be covering health savings accounts today. I've been with Advanta since 2012. If you have any questions after the presentation, feel free to reach out to me directly. I'm always happy to help. And especially with uh, the upcoming open enrollment, we uh, definitely need to make sure that if you are interested in utilizing a high deductible healthcare plan that qualifies for HSA coverage, that you have all of the good information that you need in order to make an informed choice in setting up one of these types of accounts. So before we get started, especially when it comes to taxation and uh, individual uh, choice type plans like this that are going to be very specific to the individual taxpayer. We definitely wanna make sure that we uh, just make sure you understand what the uh, purpose of this presentation is for. So Advanta IRA and our employees do not provide investment advice or endorse or promote any products. All information and materials are for educational purposes only and all parties are encouraged to consult with their attorneys, accountants, and financial advisors before entering into any type of investment or selecting any specific type of an account over another. So what is an HSA? <clears throat> now, this is very important to understand with regard to the context of these plans that just because something is a savings type of an account that you have for a medical plan does not necessarily mean that it is an HSA. And we'll cover a lot of the different types of, of accounts as well, because there's things like flex spending accounts or health reimbursement accounts that while yes, they may be accounts that have money in them that have contributions from an employer that you can use to pay for medical expenses, just because you have one of those types of plans does not necessarily mean that you can then in turn have an HSA as well. These are very specific type of savings accounts that are associated with high deductible healthcare plans. And I'm going to be abbreviating that as HDHP for the remainder of the presentation. So if you hear me refer to an HDHP, that is going to be in reference to the high deductible healthcare plan that the HSA has to be uh, qualified against. So just because you would like an HSA or you think that one would be a great idea, well, yes, they certainly are very good ideas and tax planning tools, understanding that you have to have the correct type of coverage in order to excuse me, in order to have one of these types of plants and to be able to contribute to one is paramount of importance to understanding these types of plans and planning accordingly. So a little bit of history of this, because it's important to understand where, they, where they've come from and what, what are and aren't HSAs, because just because you are saving for healthcare costs doesn't necessarily mean that that type of an account is an HSA or that it does qualify. So this kind of stuff starts back in about 1984, uh, where we have a report uh, that is published by the National Center for Policy Analysis about the need for medical IRAs to start helping people save for long-term uh, medical costs and to try to relieve some of the burden off Medicare uh, due to rising healthcare costs. Uh, there's a lot of stuff different that are pitched around for a different type of MS medical savings accounts. And then in 1996, we kind of have our first stab at this with the Archer MSA. Uh, it's, a, <clears throat> it's a type of an account that uh, early, early adopters and employers were able to utilize to have uh, uh, contributions into these plans that then could be used to pay for higher for, for medical expenses, uh, but could not be rolled over year to year um, and adjustments were made to the plan tax-free. Now, this was again, a good kind of initial start, but again, these have been phased out. Some older individuals might still have Archer MSAs kicking around, but these have almost completely exclusively gone away. Um, they, they are really no longer a, a function of, of, of healthcare savings plans anymore. Uh, now in 2002, the Treasury Department rules that health reimbursement account contributions can be rolled over year to year, but employees lost the plan when they left employers. So unused balances were lost. So a lot of people now with these types of plans think that these might be HSA accounts. They are not. These types of HRAs, which we'll get a little bit more into in a little bit, uh, <clears throat> one, they're not portable from job to job. So if you had money in there, Essentially, it's not necessarily your money that was employer contributed funds into this HRA plan. You would then in turn not get to take that with you if you left a job. It's kind of a user lose scenario. And in 2003, we have the HSA coming into existence. So almost 
we're going on, on almost 20 years of these things being in existence and people getting to kind of fine tune their usage. Now, these HSAs allow for portability from job to job. They can be rolled over and accumulate funds uh, in perpetuity for as long as the excuse me, as long as the account holder is still alive. And you can also use them for non-health reasons as well. So unlike the HRAs or FSAs, so health spending accounts and health reimbursement accounts, HSAs can be used for non-medical reimbursement expenses. So if you wanted to utilize one and take a distribution for a non-healthcare related expense, let's say you wanted to pay off some credit card debt, you wanted to pay off a mortgage, you wanted to really do whatever you would like to do with those funds, you are certainly able to do that. However, the tax qualification and the taxation of that distribution for a non-reimbursable expense uh, is going to be different than a reimbursable expense. So just a little bit more in depth on what these other types of plans are not going to really cover too much of the MSA, although it is certainly good to understand that those were kind of the <clears throat> uh, were kind of the catalyst for this whole thing getting started with having a a healthcare IRA, if you will. So right now the flex spending accounts are really something that are still uh, in existence and that people use, and sometimes people get confused on when it comes to an HSA qualifying plan. So a lot of people think that, oh, if I have a plan, and granted, these are typically higher deductible plans that have the flexible spending accounts, so they have higher, they have lower premiums and higher deductibles, you can use these types of plans to, or the accounts, should I say, to cover expenses not paid by insurance, including deductibles, copay, and coinsurance. Under the Affordable Care Act, a employee can roll over $500 from year to year under a flexible spending account. Now, the maximum contribution uh, for 2020 and 2021 is $2,750 to one of these types of plans for, for a family plan. So you can only roll over <clears throat> excuse me, $500 of an FSA year to year, whereas with an HSA, you can the entire balance rolls over from year to year, and it's not tied to your employer's plan. Now, employers can offer HSA qualifying coverage, and you are certainly able to hold that HSA where you would like to. You're not necessarily bound to the terms of saying holding it at the one particular bank that they may have initially set it up for. So if you want to self-direct and you want to invest in alternative assets other than just maybe having a cash account where you're fighting inflation or something like that, you are certainly able to do so. However, you're not able to do that with an FSA. So the flex spending account is very static. It's tied to that plan and that employer. If you leave that employer or change insurances, then that money might go away. So it's kind of a user lose scenario and it's a very specific use case. Now, benefits of an HSA account. There are very many of them, but we're going to also go into some of the issues with qualifying for an HSA and some of the issues with the Affordable Care Act. Not necessarily to say anything disparaging against the ACA. It definitely does a lot of good. There's, you know, say there's a lot of polarizing views on either side uh, with regard to looking at the Affordable Care Act as a good, bad, or indifferent item of legislation. But it, it, the ACA did very much change a lot of things with regard to how many types of plans can qualify for HSA coverage, and we'll go into that in a minute. But some of the benefits of the HSA accounts are the government encourages better healthcare spending habits. So the thought is, if you spend your own money, you'll do more research on what you are purchasing and make better decisions, more informed decisions. And theoretically, this will ultimately lower healthcare costs. Now, there certainly are a a number of different reasons why healthcare costs continue to rise. But again, this is something that you as the informed investor can utilize to help reduce your tax burden, to help you keep more money of what you've earned, and then also be able to pay for your medical expenses in a tax advantaged way, and also have tax exempt or tax deferred growth within one of these types of accounts. Now, these accounts are certainly special savings accounts just for healthcare related expenses. They're not necessarily intended to be used for non-medical reimbursement expenses, although with an HSA, unlike an FSA or an HRA, you can use these for non-medical expenses. So these are looked at as supplemental to healthcare insurance coverage. So you do have to have coverage. It supplements your coverage. That's another important thing to understand is that if you are a non-insured individual, if that's your election to, to do so, you can't just have an HSA uh, without having it be attached to a qualifying type of HDHB coverage. So keep in mind that these types of accounts are intended as a supplement 
to your healthcare coverage, not as to be the healthcare coverage in and of itself. So if you just self-insure your healthcare, unfortunately, you cannot just utilize an HSA as a standalone. Now, the awesome thing with these is that they're portable. So even if you switch employers or switch plans, you can take the HSA with you. Or if you no longer have HSA qualifying healthcare coverage, the HSA still remains in existence. It doesn't go away or blow up. You can <clears throat> continue to have it. You just can't necessarily continue to make contributions. Uh, you get tax-free growth and tax deductible contributions into the plan and you get tax-free distribution. So you get to double dip on both of the benefits of IRA. So you get the tax deductible nature like a traditional IRA, you get the tax-free growth just like any IRA, and then distributions from the plan if it's for a qualified expense are tax-free just like a Roth IRA. So you get a deduction going in, exemption on any taxation of growth, and then no taxation on distributions. So it really goes to show and illustrate and benefit just how incredibly powerful HSAs can be for people. So HSAs, again, are designed to supplement HDHB coverage and allow for payment of non-covered healthcare expenses with tax deductible money. And we'll get into why that's a very important distinction as well. And please keep in mind, if you do have any questions, type those into the chat box. I am certainly happy to address any questions as they come up with people. You don't necessarily have to wait for the end. So here's some example benefits of utilizing an HSA. If you're using an HSA and you contribute $3,550 of earnings to that plan, you get a deduction on your income tax return. At a 20% tax bracket, that's a tax savings of $710. Now, distribute up to $3,550 tax-free to pay for healthcare expenses, and then any unused funds can grow tax-free. So essentially, you get a free 710, let's say you were to contribute in that first scenario to an HSA, you get a deduction, so you automatically get a $710 savings. You could immediately turn around and distribute that $3,550 to yourself without having to pay any taxes or penalties to use to pay for healthcare expenses in that in that given year. So again, you can really kind of amp, ramp up the amount of tax savings you get just by the deductions alone that you have. Now, let's say uh, no HSA involved. You have $3,550 after or out-of-pocket expenses after tax to pay for health care. You would have to have $4,400 of earnings and pay 20% tax to end up with the $3,550. And all future earnings on unused funds are also taxed at capital gains rates or potentially earned income rates, depending on what type of earnings and what uh, and and how those actually are realized by you as the investor. So just going to show how much benefit that just on a small amount of money like this, you can almost have a thousand dollars swing on just the tax savings on, you know, something as, as small as $3,500 to $4,500. <clears throat> uh, let's see. So we have a couple questions. Uh, they are good questions, and we'll certainly get uh, into these as well. Uh, let's see. So we have one that says, can you have a family HSA or independent HSA for each family member? Well, it depends on the healthcare coverage. If the healthcare coverage is HSA qualifying coverage and everyone in the family has a separate healthcare plan, then they could each have individual HSAs. However, if you have a family HSA, then that would have to be coverage based on the uh, cover the the plan covering all the individuals of that household and they would just have one family HSA. Most of the time it's one or the other. Um, sometimes you do have two different ones, but that's very, very rare. And then uh, do you have to have earned income to contribute to an HSA as opposed to unearned income? Yes, it has to be uh, income that is going to be uh, ordinary earned income is what you use to qualify the contribution. The same type of earning, the same type of income that you use to qualify a contribution to an IRA, whether that's Roth or traditional, has to be used for the, <coughs> excuse me, the HSA contribution as well. Great questions. Thanks. Keep them coming in. So there's two types of HSA accounts, like we just mentioned. So with regard to the individual versus the family. You have the individual HSA can cover only one individual with a solo healthcare plan. So if 
everyone in the household has individual HSA qualifying coverage, they could each have an individual HSA. However, uh, if there is a family plan that covers everyone, it would you could only have the one family HSA covering the entire family. You couldn't necessarily use that one plan to qualify, let's say, three or four different HSAs in order to ramp up your contributions to those plans. Now, the self-only coverage deductible must be at least $1,400, and the out-of-pocket maximum must be at least $6,900. And for a family HSA, the family coverage deductible must be at least $2,800, and the out-of-pocket maximum must be at least $13,800. Now, while those may not seem, at least in the context of today's, <clears throat> excuse me, of today's uh, out of pockets and deductibles, there are some other caveats that do make these plans not necessarily applicable to everyone. This is not the only metric to use. We'll get into some of the other finer points and, and some of the things that the ACA has brought into play that make these plans a little bit more make these plans a little bit less accessible with the types of plans that are on open enrollment marketplaces. But just keep these figures in mind. The best thing to do, and I tell this to everyone, is that if you're interested to know if an, a plan qualifies for an HSA, give the plan provider a call. Or if you are going through open enrollment, which uh, opens up this week, I believe, uh, you can uh, just just you can sort the search just by HSA qualifying healthcare plans. Let's see, um, got a couple more questions before we get to the next slide. Uh, what is the cutoff date for HSA contributions? So we'll get into that a little bit later because there's a few different qualifications of saying when you can or can't make the, the contributions. The thing to keep in mind is the first day of the last month rule for yearly contributions. Uh, so just keep that up, it's coming up in a few slides. I don't wanna kind of cannibalize the presentation with that one, but uh, we'll get into that certainly in a minute. And can you deduct medical expenses that were paid by the HSA? No. And can HSA accounts be used to cover dental expenses? Uh, yes, and we will get into how that would apply and how it wouldn't apply as well. So here are some of the requirements for having an HSA. And again, this is some of the things that you're gonna see why the plans that are most utilized on the Affordable Care Act open marketplace uh, don't always necessarily uh, coincide with the requirements for HSA. So that's why you don't see as many of these types of plans. So you can't have any co-pays for office visits other than preventative care, annual physicals, prenatal, well-child immunizations, and certain screenings. So if you just want to go into the office, if you get sick or something and there is a copay, then that type of plan would not qualify for an HSA. So that is something very important to remember <clears throat> with regard to how these types of plans work because it that is a very common function of a lot of healthcare plans currently in the marketplace. And I see someone has their hand raised. Uh, please do just type the question into the chat box if you have a question. Um, the, I can't really necessarily address hand raises through this, so just type the question. Uh, for 2021, the self-only deductible coverage again is $1,400. For the family coverage deductible must be at least $2,800, and the out-of-pocket maximums for self-coverage can't, uh, ex can't exceed $8,150 and family coverage is $16,300. You cannot have other healthcare coverage. You can have vision, dental, workers' comp, long-term disability, or long-term or disability insurance, but you can't be covered by two different healthcare plans. So you can't have an HSA qualifying plan and then also have another type of healthcare insurance. You can also not be enrolled in Medicare or Medicaid, and you cannot be claimed or listed as someone else's dependent. So kind of going back to the initial, one of the first questions regarding, can you have a, a individual HSA for everyone in the family? Well, you know, if, if you're talking about your children, then unfortunately, you know, they're gonna be named as uh, dependent, so they couldn't necessarily have a HSA for them in any regard, uh, and then also, <clears throat> Um, just for how the insurance would work with that. So again, have a high deductible healthcare plan and the the basic metrics of the HDHP are listed right there, number one. You can't have other healthcare coverage. You can have vision, dental, workers' comp, long-term or disability insurance. You cannot be enrolled in Medicare or Medicaid and you cannot be claimed as someone else's dependent are the four main functions of what you have to focus on when it comes to qualifying for an HSA account with regard to what the HDHP has to include. <clears throat> now, we had a question of when the deadline for making contributions to these kind of plans is. Now, 
that's a little bit more complicated than just saying, oh, you have to do it by your April 15th deadline. So there's a rule called the first day of the last month rule with HSA accounts. For the purpose of making a full year HSA contribution, you are treated as having an HSA for a whole calendar year as long as the HDHP plan is in place by 12-1 of that year. So that means if you want to make a 2021 contribution, and let's say you haven't had high deductible healthcare coverage all year, but you're looking to enroll in open enrollment to have the HDHP plan in place. If you want to make a full contribution for this year, you don't necessarily have to make the contribution by 1231. What you do is you have to have the plan in place by 12-1, so first day of the last month, and then you can make the 2021 contribution up until your filing deadline, not plus extensions, by the timely filing deadline. Now, 2021, Taxes obviously had the augmented timely filing deadline moved into May. So whatever the IRS states is the timely filing deadline is when you have to make the HSA contribution so long as that the HSA account was established, or sorry, so long as that the, the high deductible healthcare plan, not necessarily the HSA, the high deductible healthcare plan was in place by 12-1 of that year. Uh, let's see, sorry. Um, so here's an example. Uh, if Ben enrolls in an HDHB plan at a, on 11-30-2021, he can contribute the full $3,500 to his HSA account for 2021 and take a deduction on his tax return. He has up until April 15th or whatever the fi timely filing deadline is to open the HSA and make a qualifying contribution and make a contribution to that to that account. Now, if Ben loses that healthcare coverage prior to 11-30-2022, he must take a prorated distribution from the HSA account, and whatever that prorated distribution is, he will owe taxes and a 10% penalty on that prorated distribution. So keep in mind that you also do have to maintain the healthcare coverage by taking advantage of the first day of the last month rule for a rolling 12 months after that. Uh, you have to maintain that coverage. So typically, that's not too much of an issue unless you maybe are having your healthcare coverage tied to an employer or you had HCHP coverage, you got a job that offered better benefits in your perception and you wanted to terminate your HSA, HDHP coverage. So that might be an issue that you would run into. So definitely good thing to understand, especially the individual who was asking uh, regarding the cutoff date for HSA contributions. You have to take into account the first day of the last month rule, uh, and then you can, so long as you have the HDHB coverage in place, then you can you can have up until your filing deadline to uh, contribute for the previous year. Uh, can HSA accounts be used to cover dental expenses? Yes, so long as the expense was not already covered by separate dental insurance. You have, let's see another question. You have a copay 20% after meeting deductible limit. Uh, again, some of those more nuanced questions of copay and deductible limits, if it's a copay for office visits other than those listed, typically that would not be HSA qualifying coverage, even if you have met a deductible limit. But again, what I tell people is that even if some of these metrics don't necessarily coincide with some of the written policies always go by what the plan provider indicates is HSA qualifying coverage because ultimately the responsibility for notifying a participant according to the eight according to the Affordable Care Act is the, their notification of plan features and that is a plan feature of being qualifying for HSA coverage. Uh, are there catch up um, amounts for contributions? We'll cover that here in a minute. So contributions to HSAs, they must be made in cash. You can't do an in-kind contribution. You can't transfer something like stock or something else or property from another HS, for, from yourself personally into the plan or from another IRA. Uh, you can do a one-time rollover from traditional or Roth IRA to an HSA, uh, but typically that's not always the best shake for people because one, it's only up to the contribution limit. You can't just say, hey, I'm going to take 50 grand from my traditional IRA and, and roll it over to an HSA. You have to, <clears throat> it has to be from just up into those limits. And especially it's a bad deal if it's a Roth IRA. So, you know, you pay taxes going in, uh, then you get no perceived additional tax break for the rollover contribution. And then, you know, you're not paying tax on the back end, but you restrict yourself as to what you can use those funds for. So most of the time, people just take it out of their own income and take that deduction 
for the contribution, because again, there really isn't a huge benefit to doing it from a traditional Roth IRA, but the option is there for taxpayers to do it nonetheless. You cannot use SEP or simple funds for this. So if you have a SEP IRA or simple IRA, or if you have a 401k, you cannot use that for the purposes of, of making the one-time rollover contribution to an HSA. Contributions can be made by an employee or an employer on behalf of the employee. So if you have HSA qualifying coverage, so an HDHP through an employer, they can make contributions on your behalf to that plan. So keep that in mind. Um, you know, if you have that type of plan, they you certainly can. You can offer that coverage if you're an employer, but you also might be given that kind of coverage and benefit if you are an employee. Employee tax deductions, employee contributions are tax deductible. Employer contributions are not included in the employee's income. So that is a benefit. It's not as if they are taking it as a payroll deduction. If they are stating that, or a payroll deferral like they would with taxation, an employer can make the contributions and it wouldn't necessarily be included in your compensation. Deductions can be taken even if you don't itemize, which is a very big benefit. And contributions can be made up until the tax filing date. Paula, you, you did enter a question into the correct place, so just type another statement into where you did, and I'll certainly be happy to address address that as well. Let's see, we have another question. Uh, my employer makes annual contributions to my HSA. Must that be deducted from the 3550 max? Yes. So you have to see what they have made as a contribution because it is a total limit according to whether that is a, a that, that's an individual plan max. So you would have to see how much, whether they are planning to do it or how much they have contributed, and then you can make up the difference. Uh, Let's see, Phyllis asks, uh, when you are 65, can you roll over an HSA to an IRA? No, but you can treat it as an IRA. So at the age of 65, you can take penalty-free distributions um, and pay taxes on it for non-medical related items. And we have, can anyone make a contribution for me? Uh, if they are not in your household, no. So it has to be from your income. Now, someone could, you know, if you had income, but let's say didn't have cash, you could potentially look into strategies maybe with someone gifting you the money, but you have to be able to show earned income for that given year and at least the amount of the contribution that you're making. So if you had no earned income uh, or, or active income for a given year, but you, let's say you had received dividend income or other items, or you have been gifted money, you couldn't necessarily use that as a qualification for the, uh, the contribution to the HSA. Contribution limits, uh, HSA for self-care coverage for 2021. Uh, we got a little bit of a bump uh, from, from the previous years. We got a $50 bump on the HSA self-care coverage for 2021 and the family coverage got a bump by a hundred bucks and you get a thousand dollar catch-up contribution over the age of 55. So we did have someone ask that. So just keep that in mind as well. Alrighty, so qualified medical expenses. We keep saying, you know, if you're reimbursing yourself for uh, medical expenses, what is that? So if you want a more comprehensive list, uh, reference IRS Publication 502. It is easy enough, just Google it. It's, you know, pretty easily listed out there. It's, I'm not gonna lie, as far as IRS publications go, it's pretty easy to digest. So with regard to that, what can you use as a tax-free distribution from an HSA? So you can pay for a healthcare plan deductible. Again, you have to have paid that personally. The cost of doctor's visits, dental care. So if you have um, office visits, x-rays, cleanings, fillings, braces, any type of dental care, only if the expense is not covered under another plan. Remember I said you couldn't have other healthcare coverage, but you could have things like supplemental vision or dental or hearing. Now, if you had already had an expense, let's say for braces covered partially by dental insurance, you couldn't use an HSA distribution and the tax-free as a qualifying HSA distribution to cover that type of an expense. So you couldn't use it to cover the remainder. Vision care, again, so long as it's not covered by another plan, exams, glasses, contacts, surgery, X, Y, or Z, medications, prescriptions, um, prescribed over-the-counter meds, so you couldn't necessarily just walk into your local CVS or Walgreens or, or Rite Aid and go use your HSA to buy ibuprofen. 
unless you had a prescription for that type of over-the-counter medication. Or let's say you had heartburn medication that was prescribed to you. I know some popular ones have come off of uh, prescription requirements or allergy medication, something like Allegra. If you have a prescription for that, you can use HSA funds to reimburse yourself, but you cannot do that unless you have a prescription for it. Chiropractors are covered, bandages and other over-the-counter first aid kits, disabled dependent care expenses, capital improvements to a home with the main purposes of medical care. So think about something like a wheelchair ramp or a uh, what the, the mechanized system she used to get up and down stairs, uh, long-term care, psychiatric and psycho psychological care, and lodging and trip expenses for medical care. So if you have to take a trip, let's say you were undergoing oncology treatments for cancer or something, and you need to take a trip specifically for a certain type of treatment, you could use an HSA plan to reimburse yourself for all the trip expenses and the lodging and everything else like that, as well as the expenses for that for that trip that was had to be taken for that for that qualifying care. So keep that in mind. It's not just necessarily paying for a doctor's visits or an ER bill. It can pay for a lot of other types of things, and you don't have to pay taxes on any of those types of distributions. Uh, let's see a question, uh, and we'll get into this in a second. But can you reimburse yourself for for prior year qualified expenses? We will certainly get into that because sometimes yes, sometimes no. So what are non-qualified <clears throat> medical expenses? So healthcare plan premiums, except for COBRA, non-prescription drugs, weight loss programs, if the purpose is for cosmetic reasons, so like cosmetic liposuction, let's say. Um, if it is ordered by a doctor, so bariatric surgery um, or for treatment of some type of disease, yes, you can uh, utilize that. But again, it, can't, it has to be medically necessary pursuant to a doctor's diagnosis of a disease. Cosmetic surgery, teeth whitening, uh, nutritional supplements, cosmetic hygiene products, babysitting, healthcare clubs, uh, medical expenses reimbursed by an FSA or medical savings account. So if you had used some type of flex spending account or something else like that to reimburse yourself for that, you cannot then in turn also take a tax for distribution or replenish another account with that. Then that also kind of goes into the, the issue of having dual medical coverages as well. Uh, and then payments for future medical expenses. So you have to incur the expense and then reimburse yourself for that expense uh, for taking the qualifying HSA distribution, for the tax-free distribution that is. Now getting back to how long you can wait to reimburse yourself, and this is kind of really pertinent to that, you have to record keep your expenses. The IRS puts the burden on you to keep records to show that the distributions were exclusively to pay or reimburse qualifying medical expenses. So you have to keep receipts and you have to do that in perpetuity if you want to reimburse yourself for something much later on down the road. The qualifying medical expense has not been previously paid or reimbursed uh, from another source and the medical expense had not been taken as an itemized deduction in any year. So again, you don't have to, you don't have to itemize your deductions to be able to take the tax-free distributions, but if you had itemized a deduction and taken a write-off of a medical expense, you cannot then in turn also go back and reimburse yourself with a tax-free distribution for that medical expense if you had claimed it as a uh, deduction on an itemized return for a given year. Now, you can take a tax-free distribution anytime after the expense has occurred but you have to keep those receipts and records. It's not like tax returns or receipts where they say a normal audit goes back, let's say seven years. You have to do that in perpetuity. So 30 years down the road, you could have continued to accrue contributions and earnings tax-free. And if you wanted to take a distribution from the HSA tax-free to reimburse yourself for a qualifying medical expense, you can do that 30 years later, but you have to maintain the records. So again, that's one thing that you just need to make sure that you're record keeping things in a long-term capacity. Um, HSA distributions are tax-free regardless of, of age or how long the plan has been in existence. As long as these requirements are met, the distributions are for qualified medical expenses and the expenses incurred after the HSA was established. <clears throat> so if you had a medical expense under a previous plan, or let's say you had a medical expense and then you got coverage and then you had an HSA established, unfortunately, if that expense was incurred before the medical before the HSA was, was established, you cannot utilize those plan funds to reimburse yourself from that. So while yes, you do have the ability to utilize the first day of the last first day of the last month rule 
to establish and fund an HSA, you do have to make sure that any expenses you want to reimburse are incurred after the establishment date of that HSA. So it's not necessarily the funding date. So establishing the HSA and doing it as soon as you have the qualifying healthcare coverage established is a good idea because that gives you a lot more flexibility as to what potential medical expenses you can reimburse. So uh, you cannot use an HSA to pay for COBRA. Uh, can I still open and contribute for last year? No, uh, you can no longer uh, contribute for 2020. Uh, you can only do for 2021. You can open an HSA and contribute for 2021, and you can, uh, in 2022, you can contribute as well for 2022, but not until after the 31st. <clears throat> Is there any advantage to pay to paying qualified medical expenses in a later year? Well, absolutely. So if you want to pay a qualifying medical expense in a future year, that means that you had more funds held within that HSA that get to grow tax free. So you get to compound, you get to take advantage of the compounding tax sheltered uh, growth of the HSA. So you're not paying any taxes, the earnings are continuing to accrue tax free, and then you get to take a tax free distribution. So so long as that you can stomach that expense in a given year, you get to continually grow that HSA and then take a reimbursement distribution at a later date, you've gotten to earn a lot more money a lot quicker without paying taxes on it is the a big it, advantage for not taking the immediate reimbursement or paying the expense directly with the HSA. So here's some examples of how you, how an HSA works. So in 2017, Joe opens self-only HSA and makes a full $3,400 deductible contribution. Joe has $1,000 of qualifying medical expenses from May through December of 2017. At the end of the year, takes a $1,000 distribution from an HSA tax-free. The remaining $2,400 plus any accrued earnings remains in the HSA for future expenses. 2018 rolls around. <clears throat> Excuse me. Joe makes another $3,400 contribution to the HSA. In March of 2018, Joe has surgery, costing him three grand out of pocket. He takes an immediate distribution in March to pay the expenses. That leaves $2,800 in the HSA and accumulates $500 or more expenses in 2018, but he takes no further distributions. So he's still got $2,800 left in the HSA. He accrued another $500 of, of expenses, but didn't reimburse himself for it. In 2019, Joe has $2,800 plus any additional earnings in the HSA, and he accumulates $500 of qualified medical expenses, but again, does not take a reimbursement. In January, he makes a $3,400 deductible contribution to the HSA. During 2019, he accumulates another $1,000 of qualifying medical expenses, but takes no distributions. So he has $1,500 of qualifying reimbursable medical expenses, doesn't take any distributions, and then he also makes an additional $3,400 of contributions to his HSA. Now 2020 rolls around. Joe has $6,200 plus earnings in the HSA, and he has an additional $1,500 of expenses. Again, Joe makes his annual contributions and accumulates 1,000 or so in expenses, and he takes no distributions from the HSA. So keep in mind, he's, he's accruing thousands of dollars of medical expenses, which again, over any given year, that's not a whole lot. You know, 1,000 bucks here in a given year is, is not, you know, too terribly much. It's, you know, maybe <clears throat> $100 a month in healthcare, cover, healthcare costs. Now, in 2030, at the beginning of the year, Joe now has about $60,000 in his HSA. So this is made up of contributions and earnings in the plan over the past uh, 13 years. In the last 12 years, he has had $20,000 of qualified expenses, but took no distributions. Now, keep in mind, all this, the $60,000 has had no taxes being paid on, and he's gotten deductions every year, so potentially has gotten money back on his taxes and paid no taxes on any type of earnings from those contributions in that plan. So in 2030, he decides to take $20,000 out tax-free from the HSA. So he gets to reimburse himself for all those expenses while also keeping in $40,000 of contributions and earnings into that HSA. Now, 2031 rolls around, and Joe decides he wants to remove some funds from the HSA, but he has no more qualified medical expenses. 
So what are his options in this case? If Joe's under the age of 65, the distributions from the HSA are subject to income tax and a 20% penalty. So it's a little bit higher than your normal early withdrawal excise tax penalty from a traditional IRA. If Joe is over 65 or he has become medically disabled, the 20% penalty does not apply, but the distributions are subject to income tax. Let's see, we have a question. Wouldn't I need to edit my earlier tax return from the year the qualified medical expenses was incurred. In other words, wouldn't that later payment need to be applied to an edited return from that year? Well, so keep in mind that you wouldn't need to edit a return because you cannot reimburse yourself for a medical expense that you have claimed as a deduction on an itemized return. So in a in a given year, let's say in this context, and you know Joe is just paid with after-tax funds, has used that to pay for the medical expense. He's not taking a deduction for those medical expenses. So in the future, he's in reimbursing himself for those qualifying medical expenses that he has had with that. Again, since you haven't taken a deduction, then it wouldn't necessarily uh, apply. Uh, let's see, we got another question. Um, I am retired and have no earned income, only unearned. So the HSA wouldn't apply to me. Okay, yeah, uh, well, you know, you can always try to get some earned income, you know, sell some widgets on eBay or, or uh, you know, sell something on, on Amazon or something. But yeah, you do have to have uh, earned income in order to qualify the contribution. So if it's all passive, unfortunately, that uh, wouldn't work out. So naming beneficiaries for your HSA. Now, the rules for HSAs are definitely going to be markedly different from what you're used to with IRAs where someone can inherit an IRA. Uh, you can inherit an HSA, but the rules are significantly different than IRAs or 401ks. If you name a spouse, so a legally married spouse, as the beneficiary, then the spouse can treat the HSA as their own and use it for qualifying medical expenses for any non-spousal beneficiary. So this is kids, this is trust. So if you have all of your stuff going to a trust, maybe not, maybe you don't want to have the HSA going to, to the trust, especially if you're married and your spouse is still alive. <clears throat> For any non-spousal beneficiary, the HSA ceases to be an HSA account, and the value of the HSA account is taxable to your beneficiary in the year you die. So if it is anything other than a, than a spouse, and this includes trusts, this includes anything else, so you need to make sure that if your spouse is still alive, that they're probably named as the primary beneficiary, and then you can split it off from there. Uh, but again, you you can't, if you're a non-spouse, so you could say your father dies and has an HSA and you're named as a beneficiary, you're taking that plan as a taxable, uh, as taxable income for you in that given year. And also that goes for estates as well. So how can you invest these funds? Well, there's many options available to you for this. Now, namely, we operate in the the alternative asset sphere. So things that aren't tradable securities, things that aren't mutual funds, bonds, and the like. So what we see clients utilize their HSAs for is investing in things like real estate, uh, multifamily syndications, precious metals, private notes and mortgages, private securities. You know, the, the, the options are really limitless when it comes to what you can use to invest your HSA and especially some of the great returns that can be seen utilizing uh, some of these alternatives to Wall Street as well. However, there are certain things that you cannot invest in. You can't buy a life insurance policy with your HSA, and you can't buy anything that's collectible or things like artworks, alcohol, uh, antiques, stamps. Uh, you can buy certain types of coins that are traded on their bullion content value, but you can't buy uh, like rare coins for their appreciable uh, scarcity uh, value. So, you know, if it's if it's a coin that's traded on anything over than just its uh, content value of the precious metals, then that would not be allowable. So, HSA uh, investment restrictions. So, there's certain people that you cannot invest with as well. So, you cannot buy or sell anything directly from yourself as the HSA owner or your spouse. You cannot buy or sell anything or transact directly with lineal descendants and ascendants of the HSA owner. So think about your family tree and go directly up and down. So mother, father, son, daughter, uh, or any business entity owner controlled by a disqualified person. So again, if your parents, spouse, or children own a business entity, you could not directly transact the HSA with that entity as well. Let's see, we've got another question. Uh, since only the amount above your... Uh, income is taxable is the expense still not reimbursable after the uh 
let's see. Since only the amount above your adjusted gross income is deductible, is the expense still not reimbursable up to the non-deductible limit? I, I am not necessarily sure what you're asking with that question, um, but I would, I think I understand what you're asking, and I would still have to, I would have to refer you out to a, uh, a CPA with regard to that, because if you're talking about taxation up until your uh, AGI or MAGI, I would say that you need to talk to a CPA or tax advisor for determining that limitation uh, or any or any potential with that. Uh, let's see. Can you invest in an LLC owned by your self-directed IRA? Um, you could party them together potentially on a new deal or start a new LLC, but that would be considered self-dealing. So, you know, just as you you couldn't uh, you know sell something personally to your IRA owned LLC, uh, same thing goes with an HSA or any other retirement account. Um, you know, you you couldn't necessarily just uh, you know sell an additional tranche of membership units to an HSA. You would have to, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, either form a new partnership or uh, dissolve that LLC and then bring your LLC, your HSA in as a partner onto that deal. So investing your HSA in real estate. Uh, this is what we see a lot of clients doing. So meet Heather. Heather wants to invest in real estate uh, with others who buy, fix, and flip property. She has an HSA with 20 grand in it that is currently invested in mutual funds. She thinks she'd realize better returns by lending money on an equity participation note and doesn't want to be involved with the day-to-day -day hassles of owning the property. So she wants to be a lender, but she wants to take advantage of some of the appreciable equity uh, value increase in that deal. So they decide to structure this as uh, an EP note, equity participation. So meet Steve. He's looking for an investment partner. Uh, he has acquired a property for rehab and he needs about 20 grand uh, for rehab costs in order to then be able to sell the property. So the, the, the intersection of these two people is that you have Steve with a need for capital and then you have the HSA that is coming to the table with the, the money to lend on the deal. So here's how the deal is structured. The terms of the loan. So you have the HSA lending $20,000 and the kicker of the note, so what is going to actually be the, val the value proposition for the investment is 25% of the profits after everything is paid off. So whatever the profits on the deal are, 25% of those profits instead of a direct monthly uh, principal and interest payment are going to be paid back to the HSA. So the total profits on the sale are 30 grand. The tax-free income back to Heather's HSA is $7,500. The result is Heather, after everything has been funded and then eventually paid off, is that Heather now has $27,500 in her HSA that she can use to pay for qualified medical expenses incurred since she started the HSA, or Heather can continue to grow the HSA through additional investments and take tax-free distributions in the future. So she doesn't necessarily have to earmark just the earnings for the medical expenses. She can take all of that and invest it into another deal. She can save some for any medical expenses that come up, take a part of it, take all of it. Uh, you know, it just really depends on how she wants to move forward with that HSA as to what her ultimate strategy is going to be in the future. Now that kind of wraps it up. Uh, we're kind of hitting up right on just about an hour of what we are doing. So if you have any questions, I'll stick around for a little bit to make sure those get answered. If you would like to get a um, a copy of the slides, uh, please do just let me know. Uh, you can uh, email me. I'll put my email up, and uh, the steps to get started are relatively easy. You just need to complete an account application. Again, you don't necessarily have to have the plan, the HSA, open this year, but if you want to take a reimbursement from any expense, the expense has to be incurred after the HSA is open. So if you get the your high deductible health care plan coverage bound by December 1st of this year, you can make a full contribution for this year up until your filing date of next year, even if you didn't have coverage for the entire year. So keep in mind, uh, you know, there are certainly some uh, nuances and complexities with this that we're certainly happy to help out with. Again, my name is Alex Perney. My contact information is right up there on the slide. If you would like any additional information, I'm certainly happy to help uh, or provide you with a copy of the slides or anything like that. You can certainly uh, reach out to me directly and I will take care of that. So again, I will stick around for a little bit to answer any questions, but that is our presentation today. Thank you very much for everyone for joining and I hope everyone has a wonderful Thanksgiving and upcoming holiday weeks and season. Thank you.